Greetings and welcome to the Quest for Wisdom podcast, where we search for nuggets of wisdom from the lives of some truly amazing people. Today's guest is John Alice. John is the owner of the Comedy Clubhouse in Barcelona, as well as the unicycle jousting champion of New Zealand. If that's not impressive enough, John is also a stand-up comedian and recently opened for Tom Segura. Today we talk about unicycling, juggling, life without alcohol, and we also discuss some tips for running a business. To find out more about John, check the links in the description. John is a light-hearted and highly driven human, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome, 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 John Alice, to the 16th episode. Oh yeah, you better put your headphones on. The 16th episode of the Quest for Wisdom podcast. Nice. Potentially 17th, actually. I can't remember. Um, anyway, how does that make you feel? It's good, man. It's a good number. 16 and 17, both fantastic numbers. So I'm, I'm happy either way. Brilliant. Well, I'm glad to have you here. I feel like I'm sat talking to the mafia boss <laughs> of the Barcelona comedy scene. Um, so I'm a little bit intimidated at the moment because maybe I could be whacked or something. Um, but, um, you are a comedian. You are also the owner of Barcelona Comedy Clubhouse, which is effectively the comedy mafia in Barcelona. Um, <laughs> we don't, we don't think of ourselves as that, but sure, I guess. <laughs> um, and you are also a unicycle jousting champion, that's which that. you just mentioned. And I'm not 100% sure if that's true, but you said you're going to tell me the story. So yeah. I think, first of all, we need to get to the unicycle jousting and debunk this potential lie. It's, I would not, I would never lie. Uh, although like many of my stories, it's a, it, it sounds a lot better than it actually is. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, true, 100% true. I'm the unicycle jousting champion of New Zealand. Unicycle jousting is a sport where there's two people on unicycles, they each have a broomstick uh, with a boxing glove on the end of it which su serves as a, as a lance. They ride at each other and whack each other with the, uh, the boxing gloved broomstick in an attempt to uh, knock the other person off. So, uh, I <laughs> entered a, when I was probably about 12 years old, I went to the New Zealand ju Juggling Festival and entered a uh, unicycle wrestling competition. Uh, I managed, I was quick, I wasn't strong, I was quick, I, I managed to sort of duck and dive, it was a, a big like a battle royale free for all type thing, oh. and I think because I was a child, everyone was like, I'm not going <laughs> to... Not gonna bother with that. Guy. This little child. <laughs> so they ended up with two of us, and then they said, "Well, okay, well, the, the final two people, they are gonna unicycle joust to see who, uh, see who wins." And you're very stable on a unicycle. People don't realize that, but but you're as stable as standing, effectively, if you can ride a unicycle well. So it's it's incredibly hard to uh, knock someone off of a unicycle with a. Uh, and so a you can ball. ride a unicycle well. Yeah. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm, Pretty good. <laughs> oh, nice. Actually, I've probably lost my uh, skills a little bit recently, but um, yeah, when I was a kid, I was deeply into it. Oh. Uh, anyway, so I ended up unicycle jousting with this this adult. We had about four runs past each other, uh, and we kept whacking each other. But it was it was almost like there was no chance that either of us were going to fall off. And then. He died of exhaustion. Yeah, depending on your version of the story, he uh, decided that he was an adult and I was a child and it, the competition probably wasn't really for him. <laughs> it wouldn't have been a particularly good look if he'd, he'd won. Uh, or he hit a bump and, and, and fell off. Um, but either way, I gained the title of the, of the unicycle jousting champion of New Zealand and I've been undefeated ever since. Yeah. That is actually pretty epic, and I really want to give it a go. I've tried unicycling only a little bit, because I used to be really into juggling. Um, much oh, yeah. like, Yeah, much like... I actually just got some juggling balls again. Um, cool. So, like, I'm trying to get back into it now, because my girlfriend just started hula hooping. Oh, yeah. And, and I was like, oh, you could hula hoop, and I could juggle. Um, and then it's like an activity we can do together, you know? Um, sure. So I was like, oh, thinking that there's probably not hula hooping juggling things to do lo and behold she then gets invited into a hula hooping juggling group yeah um so it turns out ho hooping and juggling go hand in hand so i'm like i need to get back into it 
Um, but the unicycle, my friend had one. I always wanted one, but they're always well expensive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really hard. But I imagine it is one of those things that once you get the hang of it, then it's all right. Yeah, well, we, I mean, we deeply obsessed over them for about three years, me and my um, family, maybe even longer. Five, Your family six, as well. Yeah, so I got one for, for like a birthday present. My, my cousin got one first and he was very cool, my cousin Michael. Um, so we saw his unicycle. He was riding to university on it and, and I decided I wanted one. So then I got one for my birthday um, and learned to ride it in about three days. It was one of those ones where it's like we weren't on the GameCube anymore. We weren't like, we, it was just, it was pure unicycling for like three days straight. We learned to do it and... Yeah, it became a massive thing in our lives. My my older brother, Joe, uh, was very good at it. He was, yeah, like top 10 in New Zealand unicyclists in terms of the uh, skills that he could do. He could do, uh, he could do one-footed wheel walking, which is so uh, obviously two feet on the pedals. Normal unicycling and then uh, wheel walking is when you take both your feet off the pedals and you move the unicycle by kind of like rolling it forward with your feet on the on the wheels and then he could do that with just one foot which is very impressive because it means you have to take one foot off of the wheel or you, you have one foot on one foot off and the the one foot has to sort of slide back and forth as you're doing it so it's um yeah he was um pretty committed to that sort of thing nice anyway so my family started selling unicycles and it was like oh it was a thing <laughs> Uh, we'd go around to, to different schools, we'd lend unicycles to, to different schools in New Zealand because it's supposed to be quite good for like uh, brain gym type stuff. Mm. Um, so we'd go and give, uh, travel all around the country giving um, demonstrations at, at, at different schools on, on how to ride a unicycle, teaching people and stuff. Oh my God. So this little, this little uh, accolade of unicycle champion, we've unpacked that and found actually that you come from some crazy unicycle family. Yeah, long, long <laughs> legacy of, of, of unicyclists in, in my family, for and sure. Is, is there a big contingency of unicyclists in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, there's, uh, it's, all, it's like the hula hooping and juggling thing. It's all kind of mixed in together a little bit with the um, New Zealand Juggling Festival. Um, there was... Another unicycle shop, actually, that started at the same time as uh, as we started, just by coincidence. We didn't know they existed. Uh, we started, and then they were kind of like, "What the fuck? You started a unicycle shop at the same time as us?" So there was quite a quite a deep rivalry there, actually. Um, I mean, my dad was was chilled about. It. He was like, "Look, I'm just selling unicycles. You sell unicycles, I sell unicycles. Whatever. Like, competition can make us better, type thing." Um, but they certainly didn't feel like that, uh, and they were selling. Uh, much more expensive unicycles, much more sort of professional level unicycles. Um, so they got, they didn't like us. And they were the, uh, they were the top, they were, you know, the, the, the best unicyclist in New Zealand was this guy called Tony, I believe. Big Tony. Big Tony. He was, they were the unicycle mafia. Yeah, it was, if I ever decided that I didn't want the comedy clubhouse to be the comedy mafia of, of Barcelona, it was because of, uh, Unicycle.co.nz and the way they manage the unicycle business in New Zealand. Very, uh, uh, I don't know, bitchy. <laughs> <laughs> bitchy. The great unicyclist, though, that guy Tony would go, to the, he'd, would go to some of the same demonstrations at these schools, and his thing was that he'd, like, jump over a bunch of children on his unicycle, so he'd get a bunch of children to line up, and then he'd sort of ride along and launch himself over them. Whoa. Um, yeah, yeah, so... So, respect. As a unicyclist, a lot of respect. Great um, unicyclist, terrible person. Well, <laughs> I, um, I, I'm sure a nice person, just uh, there was some tension. There was some tension in the, the New Zealand unicycle sales <laughs> game for, for a while. And as a child, I was, I was caught up in the middle of it, um, which I never expected. Yeah, that is wild. And do you, so do your family still sell unicycles? Uh, no. Do you know what? Um, quite recently, they dissolved the unicycle business. I was a shareholder, so I had to, like, sign something kind of recently saying, like, you can have my, you can have my section of it or whatever. Um, 
No, but they would uh, they would have vaguely sold unicycles for about uh, probably about twelve years or something like that. Mm. Yeah, quite a long time. And uh, would you ever get back into the unicycle industry in Barcelona? Uh, to be honest, it's not something that that excites me. I did buy a unicycle here recently. I, I got one off of Amazon. Uh, because we were doing a show here that was uh, was like a variety show, mm. so I was playing this um, street performer character, Speedy John Ellis. Uh, so I bought I bought a um, a unicycle for that, but it's not. I don't like riding it. I don't like the kind of attention you get when you ride it. Um, a lot of people being like, "Why are you going yeah, on a unicycle?" That seems very impractical. <laughs> um, yeah, the only thing I like about it sometimes is if you see somebody else riding one and you can sort of do the, like, oh, well, a unicycle, always wanted to try one of these, you know, and then <laughs> fucking tear oh. them apart. And start oh, wow, doing... I'm actually <laughs> I'm finding this quite easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this, did it take you this long to learn? <laughs> or... Yeah, that, so there's some fun like that, but I've, I've, I've left the unicycling life behind and I'm, I'm not sorry about it. Fair enough. It's, to be honest, it's making me want to get a unicycle. It is something I always wanted to do. And then <clears throat> maybe about three weeks ago or something, I saw in Raval some guy just, I just glimpsed them. I, I was in a shop and I just turned around, glimpsed someone go past on a massive unicycle. Oh, yeah, one of the giraffes. Yeah, one of the huge ones. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they were juggling. I couldn't quite see, but they were doing something anyway, just like going down the road on this massive unicycle. But on that, I would be worried that someone would just push me over. Yeah. Um... So, like, um, and it's made me really want one. Made me really want one. And unicycle, to unicycle and juggle at the same time. I had a friend who managed to, he got it, the one who got the unicycle, managed to juggle, like, three balls mildly well when he was unicycling. Yeah. Um, but that's one of my little goals. As well as doing, I mean, I think that's more of a realistic goal. My other goal is to do a front flip and a back flip. Oh yeah. Um, I just like I have dreams about it. Like I'm desperate to be able to do a backflip just yeah, once, yeah. and then I'll just quit. I saw there's like a online uh, course, or I don't know if it was like an app or something like that, but it came up on my phone the other day, and it was like learn to do a backflip within 60 days, I think it was, or, or your money back. You know, so um, you could try that. You I could, could try, try that. that. It's uh, I would be so bad at that. I'm so bad at like acrobatics and like feeling my body in the air and that kind of thing. Oh, I'm also terrible. Um, but like, there were, there were people doing it on the beach before, and there's this guy that goes and does calisthenics workout on the beach. He's like really known down there because he's about 50 or more. He's a firefighter. He looks like Tony Montana. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely jacked, but he's there all the time. And I saw him learning. He does like, you know, when they like spin around on the bars and do all the flips and stuff. He does that. And I saw him learning to do a backflip. And it, I was thinking, he can learn to do a backflip at the age of like 50. They had like a thing on the beach. I was like, surely I can do it. Yeah. Like, I'm a lump and I'm not particularly coordinated, but there's hope. I'm only 29. There's hope. And if I can, if I can do a backflip, I'll die a happy man, I think. That's, that'd be your one goal. That's, that's yeah, yeah. as long as you do that, you've, yeah. you've achieved everything you needed to Pretty achieve. much. Really, it's, it, it sounds stupid, but it's actually like, quite close to the top of my list of things that I really want to achieve in my life. Yeah. It is very cool. It's very cool when you're like hanging out in a park or whatever and some guy just like does a backflip in front of everyone. It's like And to just run along and do a cartwheel and then do one of those cartwheel and then into a backflip. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. I just I just th I also think it would be because I'm I'm starting to realise more and more that I'm so graceless in everything I do. Like when I just walk around, I just stomp around like a big oaf that I just think it would be comical for this big oaf to then just do a backflip, just do you. a cartwheel backflip. So you, maintain, like, <laughs> you maintain every other inelegant aspect of your life to uh, surprise people more. Yeah, exactly. So it's like I could just do a backflip and then like land on my unicycle and start juggling. People would be like, what is going on here? Like, who is this person? Wild. Well, I can't help you with the backflip, but if you want to borrow my unicycle, you're more than welcome to. Oh, um, yeah, that'd can, be really cool. I actually just kind of put it into storage. So I'm like, it's just taking up space. I'm not really using it. You'd have to pump up the tire, but um, yeah. How long, do, how long do you reckon it'll take me to learn? Uh, I reckon if you did like an hour a day, it'll probably take you about a month. Oh, so it's actually quite long. Yeah, I mean, the younger you are, the the quicker it is to learn. I've seen, I mean, I've seen a lot of people learn to unicycle, and some people get it quick. Um, but I would say for an adult, 
that's probably like a realistic expectation to have. Okay. Well, I'm going to do it. I, my other goal as well is that I can do three balls juggling pretty well and do some like mm -hmm. fairly decent tricks. Four balls I'm like can mildly do a little bit, but I've never been able to do five. Yeah. And I think that getting to five, if I can get to five balls... Just to just do a few little things with five, then I'd also be pretty happy. It's, I mean, juggling five balls is is pretty insane. The, the thing about juggling is that every time you add an extra ball, it gets so much harder, like way, way, way harder. So you can get, you can do. I'm pretty good with three balls as well. I can do some stuff that like looks really cool. Compared with juggling five balls, very, very easy to learn all, all the things <laughs> all the that tricks. I've learned to do with three balls, right? And when people are watching you, so it depends on the reason you're doing it, right? But when people are watching you, you do the tricks that I know, probably you know, with three balls, and everyone's like, wow, that's great, you know? Do five balls. People are not... I, I they would don't imagine understand. They don't they understand, don't understand how, how hard it is, it is yeah. what, you're, what you're doing, you know? Like, you get up to 11 balls. I think it's 11 or 13 that, that jugglers, speculators, like, theoretically impossible to do because of the amount of space in the in the air and stuff like that. So it gets insanely harder. Um, yeah, I tried to tried to learn five balls for a for a moment. Um, but I got to like I got to I got to the stage where I could do four with like one or two tricks and I could do it like not totally fluidly. Three I can do pretty fluidly, but like four I was on like the borderline of being able to get that um, but then I never pushed it because then I was like, well, the three looks way cooler. Um. <laughs> Fours, yeah. Four, like the rhythm is all off and you're either doing it, you're either doing it separate or yeah. you're crossing them over and doing it, I don't know, just four's odd. Yeah. It's um, a tough amount. But tricks with four is good. I don't think I can do any tricks with four, really. Yeah, I can't remember what it was, but it was just like, I think it was mainly just doing like changing from crossing over to doing one in each hand at the same time so like real basic tricks sure um but yeah that's the goal to be a circus <clears throat> clown because i wanted to like be part of i love being part of all the different communities in barcelona so like i've got the kind of like the comedy creative scene here and the poetry mm -hmm. and everything that goes with that i've got my rugby team oh, and cool. then now it's like if i can get this other little crew of like circus freaks um <laughs> Don't call them that. That's, <laughs> that's not your in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Circus people. Um, basically just finding all the different weirdos in Barcelona that I can just merge with. Nice. Um, and I think that they're just interesting people. Totally. Because it's like, who wakes up and decides they want to go hooping? Mm -hmm. My girlfriend. But like, <laughs> but like, it's just, a, it's just an odd thing, isn't it? Like, oh, what's your hobby? Hooping. Like, yeah, and then they just travel around to like she went to a hooping convention where they just like travel around and go hooping together and just like learn new hooping tricks and it's an it's it's just uh, I'm always on the search for things I can do that don't involve drinking or taking drugs. Sure, that that like give me some sort of little buzz because like you're learning something or you're doing yeah I some feel you. sort of thing because otherwise I'm just like well what am I doing I'm just wandering around or. If I'm not doing something useful like that, I'm basically eating. Um, I get you. <laughs> that's yeah, like yeah, my, yeah. my go-to. So I'm looking forward to getting into this little crew. I would also at some point love to do like a Barcelona's Got Talent, like, mm -hmm. but I'd probably have to not call it Barcelona's Got Talent. Yeah. Um, call it like Barcelona Tiene Talento or something, something like, something like that. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> and just like change their logo a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just funny it doesn't exist here yet. Um, they, well, they did, they did Spain's Got Talent. Mm. Harris was on Spain's Got yeah. Talent, so they have had that sort of thing. We've tried to do variety shows before. Um, kind of fun, but I feel like I'm not very tapped into that community. Like, there's a few comedians or whatever that like, also play music, or, or like Harris is a magician, so he's... Actually, you will have heard him on a previous episode... Uh, but he's connected with some other magicians, but I feel like there must be a whole wealth of, of people that have these variety-style talents that we yeah. just we don't know them, we're not connected with them. Yeah, 100%. So I'm hoping that then I can just tap in, find some more talent, and just meet some cool people, and yeah. just see some weird stuff. I also want to try fire poi. Oh, yeah? Like, I've got poi, but I never used them. I've just kind of got, like, light-up ones. Poi, mm. for people that don't know, are basically those 
balls of flame at the end of like a string that you just kind of spin around. Yeah, they yeah. look so cool. Mm -hmm. But then it like kind of reminds me of um, just I think it would make me feel like I was back doing some pagan ritual, which uh, makes me happy. Yeah, so. there's something there's something amazing about um, people doing stuff with fire like that. Um, I don't know, like bonfire nights or or uh, where was I? I was, I was in <clears throat> I think Southeast Asia or something, and they would like all the bars would have like fires on the beach, and then these guys would come out with uh, like fire staff and do this mm. uh, kind of routine, and it was always I don't know, good vibes. Epic and blowing fire from the mouth. Although I think I would always, I think I'd end up just like swallowing the paraffin. Just yeah. I like, just forget and just be like, oh god, now I've just drunk in a glass of paraffin. If you're gonna do, yeah, if you, I get into sword swallowing, if you're gonna do it, I mean, there's no old fire breathers. You just, it's just something that kills you um, slowly. It's not that you get burnt up by the fire, you just, you die slowly, or maybe you, like, inhale the flames by accident or something like that. That could happen. But, um, from what I understand, it's just incredibly bad for you. Um, <laughs> just breathing in paraffin all day long. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably why people get such a buzz from it, because they're just there, like, getting high off the fumes all day, and oh, I love this fire breathing! Could be that. Could be that. Um... Yeah, sober buzzers. So, what what are, what other sober buzzers have you have you found? What are well exercise yeah. rugby? Like, there's not. I I stopped playing rugby. I played when I was about eleven to nineteen. Mm -hmm. um, then I went to uni, and I just didn't really gel with the team that much there. And I was way more into drinking, um, and I just couldn't be asked. And then I stopped, and then I started playing again like less than a year ago. And it's like the missing piece of the puzzle in my life. Mm -hmm. It's like that aggression, team sport, camaraderie. Totally. The, I suppose if you grow up doing that, then and you stop, then you miss it. And I didn't realize I missed it. And so just releasing that, like there's, there is no, rugby is a buzz. It's a, it's a total buzz because you're running headfirst into people or they're running headfirst into you. Sure. So it's like, yeah, yeah. that's a big buzz. It's, um, it's funny, this like return to childhood things, return to the womb, like <laughs> sort of strip everything back. Yeah, I th I've I've read a couple of theories about it before, and it's like you lose yourself in your twenties, um, and then you start to find yourself towards the end of your twenties. I'm coming to the end then, mm -hmm. so it's like in your twenties you're basically interested in like getting laid and drinking and taking drugs and partying and socializing and just like not sleeping and doing everything unhealthy you possibly can. Yeah, and then you do kind of realize. Like for me, anyway, I totally forgot who I was, and you, I kind of, I've not, I don't have a very good memory in general, um, and I think a lot of that's from blacking out from alcohol hundreds and hundreds of times, but then it may not just basically remembered nothing of my childhood yeah. for like a long, long time, mm -hmm. and then now bits and pieces of it come back, and then I start to remember what I was like as a child, and then you know, like I loved juggling. Yeah. You know, I loved playing rugby. I loved all these different things. And now I'm like, well, I need to get back into these. And then you get back into them and you're like, you find again the real person that you actually are. Yeah. It's pretty mental. Yeah, yeah I've been like skimming stones recently, oh. <laughs> which is, I love it. I yeah. really enjoy it. It's like such a simple thing. But yeah, I didn't do that for a long time. And, and, and now I'm sort of back doing it. I think, I don't know how it is, how it was for you in England, but I've I found that like, I got into my teen years and then I started drinking and linked drinking with a lot of um, adult style experiences, right? So you like talk to girls for the yeah, first yeah. time and you've had a few drinks and then you're like, oh, I was actually, that went all right, you know? Mm. And then you're like, well, I better make sure I'm always drunk for that in the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the future, you know? So then you like, and this is like all through my teens uh, and then through my, my 20s as well, and I'm a couple of years behind, I guess, but um, I stopped drinking about five months ago now. And my oh, having you stopped to, drinking totally? Totally. Well, for now, yeah. Oh, you're on the... Um, I'm on the non-alcoholic beers. Um, oh, well done. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good, you know, but I'm having to, like, relearn, or not even relearn, learn for <laughs> the first time how, as an adult, to socialise with other adults without having, uh, like, a, a crutch, basically. Um, so that's, it's wild, isn't it? So it's a wild experience. <laughs> it's so mental because, like, when when you're not drinking and everyone else is, 
you realize how weird everyone is when they drink, but then you also realize how awkward everyone is and how bad people are at socializing in general. Yeah. And it's like, and yourself included, obviously. And you're like, why am I so bad? And it's like, oh, because I never learned. Because I was drunk every time totally. I ever did anything social. So I never learned any of the cues because when you're drunk, you're just like, ooh, like doing anything. Right. And there's no reason sober, like you feel like you would be worse when you're sober, but there's no reason that you would actually be worse because you're just like thinking more things, yeah. right? You, you have a, you've got more brain power to figure out what's a, what's a smart move socially. So as long as you figure out how to relax, which is tough, mm. you can then, I don't know, you'll have more suggestions or whatever. Yeah, it's it's really, really mental. And I think that some cultures seem to be just a lot better at it. Like, I feel like Americans, the ones I meet anyway, they seem just very confident to just talk to totally. anyone. They seem, I can't remember who, who I heard saying it, but like some famous person saying it recently, that Americans seem like they've all had media training. Yeah. <laughs> and it's crazy because it's true. They just walk up and it's like, they, they're like, they're just so open and confident. Whereas Big us, time. other Anglophones are more like reserved and yeah uh what is it with americans I, I think this is probably just a bit of a stereotype but you see it in in um like sitcoms and things like that where it's like oh someone's someone's going on their first date when they're like i don't know like 12 years old and then like the mum will drive them to the movies together and then pick them up afterwards and it's like a uh kind of an innocent experience that uh seems to happen or you you know you're uh, like a school dance or something you might like invite a girl to and it's like you've got chaperones they're making sure no one's drinking and stuff like that uh so i think that they, they maybe just sit in this like early teenage innocence a little longer and accept it certainly me growing up that was never like um particularly accepted and so it was like it's like when we started socializing with with girls, it'd be that we were sneaking out at night, getting a homeless guy to buy us booze, and then mm. like trying to meet people in a park somewhere. You know, it was that sort of that sort of feeling. Um, so there's that, and I think just like socially, drinking heavily over a long period of time is not acceptable in the states. It seems like it would be because you see these like frat parties and all of that kind of thing, but it's just college it's like you can go to college and be an alcoholic and that's your time to be an alcoholic and then afterwards you get your shit together you know yeah it could be that it's really um i read this book called the molecule of more about dopamine it's really interesting it basically basically explains all the different elements of our life that dopamine impacts which is obviously everything um, but it breaks it down into like politics, love, um, like a load of other categories. But one of the things it says about America in particular is that all the non-natives there, so obviously like the Native Americans are all off in their tribes, mm -hmm. or now they're integrated a little bit more, but everyone else come from Europe or Africa or wherever. Um, so I suppose the Africans are slightly different as well because they weren't, they didn't go there by choice. But everybody else that went there by choice, they are, by their nature, the exploratory ones, the dopamine-seeking people. Mm -hmm. It's the same when you... And I suppose it's the same when we meet Americans here. They're the ones that have left. So we probably only see a small subsection. You know, it's all like all of us expats here are the ones that have left. So sure. we're the ones that are looking for something, you know, the ones that are the fiends, basically, that are searching for something. Yeah. Either the fiends, yeah, possibly the fiends, or just people that are uh, open to new experiences and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I then, guess wanting a bit of a hit from it, sure. <laughs> yeah. But so then it, like, then that just kind of changed my perspective a little bit, because I was like, that probably does have a huge impact, because you're basically, all of those people then go to one country and then they breed... And then they're breeding more people who are like that. Then mm. you end up with the most individualistic country in the world that's like really high up on levels of capitalism and really high up on levels of overconsumption. And that's the whole industry is basically overconsumption. Um, because they're like hedonistic, basically. Because they're, they're hedonistic yeah. by nature. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. Um, but on that topic, what do you think it 
is within you that leads you to try things like juggling, unicycling, skimming stones, like all those more fringe activities? Um, it's a it's it's a boredom thing largely. I, I would say I like I, I like to be I, I have a low threshold for boredom, so I'm always looking to to disrupt that. Mm. Um, although these days it's easy to disrupt that by just sitting on TikTok or something like that. <laughs> like it's pretty, you can get over your boredom very very easily yeah. in, in 2023. Um, but that historically was largely the case. Um, and then it's probably at least to an extent, a laziness thing as well, right? You want to be good at something. Now, you can be good at something that everyone else does, but you're going to have to work way harder. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you want to be good at football in a country, or you want to be good at rugby in New Zealand, you have to be very committed and athletic, and I, I was never any of those things. So it's like, if you pick something that not really anyone else is doing, then you can be, you can be good at it, you know? Um, and then I used to maybe think it was like a need for attention type thing as well, but I don't, I don't actually think that that's the case. I don't think maybe it's like, yeah, maybe like, cause I was riding a unicycle to school, for example, when I was a kid. So maybe it was a bit like, you know, wanting people to notice me or, or, stand out or something like that um i mean i think it was very much the wrong way to do that <laughs> um, but maybe in my underdeveloped brain i that's that was the the theory um i think there's a lot to be said for that though like if if like because obviously when you're younger being like athletic and sporty it's just like an instant it's like an instant shot up the the hierarchy in schools. I don't know if it's sure. like that in New Zealand, but like seems to be that like that most ways because girls want the kind of the jock type. Um, and yeah. It, well, I think I think girls want someone that's good at something, right? So it's like you can you can pick your you can pick your category to an extent. Uh, but the more niche it is, the better you have to be at it, right? Like, if you're going to be a juggler, you have to be, like, a really good juggler uh, to impress a girl with, with your juggling skills. <laughs> yeah, but I think there's a, there's definitely a lot to be said for that as well. Like, I had the same thing. Like, I played guitar when I was younger, but again, like you were mentioning, I could never be bothered to practice. Mm -hmm. So, like, I just wanted to be good instantly at it. And I would play some bits, and I just never learned full songs the whole way through because I'd learn the bits I liked. And then the rest of it was boring. So totally. they're, or they're either too hard or boring. Yeah. And it's really hard to find that sweet spot. So then I'll just move on and learn like little licks from other stuff. But like then just did lessons for ages. And then I picked it back up again now. And because I've got a bit more patience, I've probably progressed more now in this tiny space, of, short space of time than I did that whole time. Yeah. But now what I did, I couldn't decide if I wanted to get a banjo or a guitar because I love the banjo, mm -hmm. um, I love banjo music. Uh, so then I found a banjitar, which is, is a banjitar. It looks like a banjo, but it's a six string, because I couldn't be bothered to learn all the new notes and everything of a banjo. Sure. So it's effectively a six string banjo that you play exactly the same as a guitar. So you tune it like a guitar, but it sounds like a banjo exactly. more or less. Ah, um, very cool. Which is really cool, because then, because I was thinking, right, like at one point I'd like to do some musical comedy, um, loads of people play with ukulele, uh, which is cool. Uh, but then I thought, well, I'm probably not going to be that good at the guitar ever. I'm mm. probably not going to be that good at the ukulele, but I'm going to be the best band guitar player I know because I've never seen anyone else play yeah. a band guitar. Ultra niche. <laughs> it's like the biggest niche. It's like I'm 100% going to be the only musical comedian with a band guitar in Barcelona. 100%. <laughs> So that ultimately, that just puts me, then you just get remembered. So you don't even have to be that good at comedy or that good at the band guitar. Yeah, he's the band guitar guy. But the combination of it is like, is perfect. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you, so you start stacking stuff, and then and then you can be the best in the world at something quite quickly, right? You, yeah. You're the, okay, you're, the, you're a banjo, banjo guy Banjitar. that tell that sings comedy songs, and then you learn to ride a unicycle, and then you do all oh of those three God. things at the same time, and I guarantee you, you're the best in the world at doing <laughs> that specific thing. <laughs> I think it's genius, because like you say, like I'm also very lazy, so... I want to get to my goals with the least effort possible. It's like, yep. is that laziness or is that just sensible? Um, yeah, well, that is a, it does seem like it. it's not smart to play by all the same rules that other people are playing by. Um, you sort of like, yeah, pick your own rules somehow and, 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 and go for it that way. Because I, I also have the same thing with, I eat a lot of weird food. Um, oh, yeah. so, and my girlfriend, like when I make these meals, sometimes she says, I guarantee you're the only person in the world that's ever eaten this combination of food. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, probably, yeah. Because like, I, I do a lot of like sprouting. So I sprout mung beans and chickpeas and stuff. So that's already quite niche, sprouting mung beans is anyway. So, um, so um, wait, so you'll sprout mung beans and then you eat them with the, the, the sprouts that are sticking out or you eat the sprout part. You eat the whole thing. Okay. So like you soak them for like a day and then you basically just leave them to germinate and then they sprout and then you can eat them raw and they're really high in nutrition and they're really, um, it makes it a lot more bioavailable for your body to absorb the nutrients in them. So like a, a chickpea, for example, you usually you'd have to Cook boil it. them or yeah. whatever. Okay. So you can do it from raw. So it's actually means you don't even have to boil them, which is even, to me, it's less hassle. Um, so I have that, and then I have like fermented red cabbage, and then I'll have like um, soy chunks or something, or I'll have like brown rice, or some weird broccoli, and then some weird little sauce I've made. And she's like, I guarantee there's no one in this world that's eating this weird combination yeah, of yeah. food. And that makes me pretty happy, to be honest, because it's not particularly tasty, but if it's unique, then I can live with that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's nice. I mean, everyone wants to individualize themselves so much these days. So it's nice if you can, I don't know, just do it in a way that's that's actually individual. Like, pick your thing, you know? A lot of people these days are like, oh, if I, in my opinion, like, oh, if I pick this identity or if I sort of identify with this particular group, then I'll be unique. And it's like, but you're, you're picking a group. You're not picking yeah, yourself, yeah. you know? Uh, so, yeah. It's like following fashion trends is always like... It's always confused me a bit because it's people seem to want to do it everyone seems to want to do it and they want to fit in i suppose it's the need to want to fit in but i suppose because i feel like i never fit in anywhere that i just pushed against that and i'm like well if i'm not going to fit in i may as well just be as odd as i want to be because then like, it's like if you can't if you can't join them well just be the total opposite of that and then you can just be good at being odd yeah, especially if you if you relax into it, um, I think almost anyone these days, especially I mean, especially in twenty twenty three, it's like kind of cool to be weird now. I think um, so. If you if you're like odd, especially if you didn't just start being odd, um, then it's starting to work a little bit more. Uh, people people see someone that's comfortable in their in their oddity and the, and they're like they kind of like it, you know. Like I was saying that to um to I was talking with Robert. Uh, you know Robert Marcus. Bobby yeah last week last week um, and we're talking about just like about gay people and that's what uh, the ones I meet here anyway like that's what I love about being around gay people and kind of like non-binary and like all that that whole category of people the ones I meet here anyway because they're like they're odd they dress in their in odd ways you know wear whatever they want just do like do odd things and just act in whatever way they're comfortable with and it's really nice and refreshing being around people that are like that that are just <clears throat> i think it's because they've like they've struggled so much to find themselves and be comfortable in their own skin that then they're just like they don't care whatsoever and they just do whatever they feel like doing yeah it's really nice to be around that because most people are not that liberated yeah i mean i guess i guess sometimes it depends like why you're doing it right so some people could do that for themselves because they're just like they feel comfortable dressing however they want to dress and this is the thing but then other people i think could probably do that because of the way that they want other people to see them yeah. which then strikes me as like a kind of an insecurity thing in that case so uh i mean whatever people want to do you know but i think if you're 
like I wear my hat all the time because <laughs> I'm like I like it. It's comfortable, you know. Um, Do you not get hot though? Uh, maybe I've just gotten used to it. Maybe I've just numbed the 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 dome of my head, you know. <laughs> um, but I think, and I think people kind of like it to be honest that it's like unique or whatever. Um, but I think maybe people would sniff it out if they thought that I was wearing it to be unique. Yeah, I don't know yeah, if yeah. That makes sense. Like you've kind of given given myself up to uniqueness and then are like sinking into it more than yeah, trying to differentiate. You know, some people do uh, like peacocking, they call it or yeah, whatever, yeah, where yeah. it's like you're wearing like a cowboy hat and everyone's like, why are you wearing a cowboy hat? That's weird. <laughs> Uh, and then you're like, glad you brought it up, actually. <laughs> of this old thing. <laughs> yeah, I just love cowboys. Uh, anyway. Yeah, sometimes, like, I want to... Sometimes I have, like, the opposite of that, where it's like, I want to wear something weird, but then I don't want people to think I'm just wearing that weird thing so that people mm -hmm. will be like, why are you wearing a weird thing? Sometimes I'm like, I just want to wear this because I like the fact it's ridiculous. But it's like, I don't need you to comment on that. But then people will think that. And it's like, I'm trying to like undo that thought process in my head. Yeah. Because like, that's what I used to be like, feel more free like that. And I was saying it to uh, this, another guy that I had on the podcast who's a, dra who's a drag queen that now I start to kind of think how other people will perceive me. And it's like a gift and a curse at the same time, because I never used to concern myself whatsoever with what people thought. Um, and I think that's probably like a protection method as well, because like when you don't feel nice about yourself, you certainly don't want other people's opinions to be affecting you. Sure. But now I do think what they, what they are, because it's like, I suppose as you grow up, you need to concern yourself a little bit with how you come across to other people. Um, yeah. Just in, in terms of like things like professionalism, you know, and just like if you're, especially if you're trying to promote yourself as a an individual or an entrepreneur or a comedian or whatever like you have to put some thought into not coming across as a total dick because yeah. otherwise you then run into the otherwise you'll spend ages just like trying to kind of defend yourself unnecessarily but could could the focus be because there's one way like you can focus on how other people perceive you or you could focus on how you be yourself, how you are yourself. Like, I, for me, what I've been trying to do recently is just be, like, as good as I can. Like, it is, like, hard working, like, mm. wake up, go to the gym, do as much work as I can, try and sell as many tickets as I can, you know, wipe the bench after I've finished working and this kind of thing. But not because I'm, like, hoping other people are going to notice or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm just... I'm doing it because that's what somebody I would... That's what somebody... I would deeply admire would yeah, do. Yeah. So I'm trying to like basically emulate someone who's better than I am um, <laughs> because I think Fake they're great. You know? um, and then once you do that, you can kind of like know that people are going to perceive you in a relatively positive way, probably, but also not have it be the, the focus of your life, you know? Because sometimes, I mean, sometimes something will happen and completely without my intention... Oh, I find I can sometimes not predict at all a negative reaction from another person. Like it, 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 it comes completely out of nowhere, mm. and I go, "Wow, I couldn't have, I could have sat down and <laughs> tried to guess at that a hundred different ways, and I never would have predicted that this action of mine would have re resulted in like this other person blowing up." You know? Yeah. So I don't know if you can. I don't know if it's healthy to focus on other people's. Uh, perception of you like that uh yeah and that's what I, that's like what i've tried to undo and in, in, in a similar way that what you're saying is just focus on just being a good person <laughs> just try and not do things that uh just don't be an arsehole yeah and that was that was difficult for me because i had a lot of practice at being an arsehole yeah um but um working hard is definitely a buzz that's like another thing. That's like a classic thing that when people stop drinking or taking drugs, that then they just become like an absolute work machine. Yeah. Because it's definitely a buzz. Like, especially when you're working for yourself, mm -hmm. then it's like a total buzz to just be getting those gains in. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I like have a routine and I fucking nail my routine every day. I'm like, yeah, sick. That's great. You know? Um. So how did you come to own the comedy clubhouse? 
Because you're pretty young, aren't you? I'm 31. Day one. Uh, so we started it. Um, we luckily, I guess, we we it was in the middle of COVID, and we were performing comedy at a place called Limerick, mm. um, and that place shut down because uh, the owner Rafa couldn't afford to keep paying the the rent. The landlord didn't adjust the rent at all for for COVID. She was kind of nasty about it, to be honest. Um, but that gave us an opportunity to negotiate, like me and Matt, my business partner, a chance to negotiate a short-term lease for six months. Um, so we opened in this place, Limerick. Um, and it, it wasn't a lot of money up front. It was a few grand, which we managed to split between us. So it was as good as it could have been in terms of uh, having a chance to test it out. Mm. And we, in Barcelona at the time, there was a, a five o'clock curfew on bars, so we had to kick everyone out by five o'clock. So we were doing shows at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. every day, Monday to Sunday. And oh, really? Yeah, which is, I mean, considering so many people lost their jobs during COVID, there certainly wasn't a lot of people willing to see comedy at one o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday. Uh, but but you've yeah, got some people coming to those. Yeah, I mean, the weekend shows were busy. People were really excited about just having something to do, right? Yeah. Um, and then we kind of got kicked out of that place uh, after the six month. Lease was up. She wanted, she wanted something from us. The owner wanted something from us that was uh, very unrealistic, in my opinion. Um, it seemed like she just needed a lot of money really quickly, like she had some kind of tax debt or whatever, and was looking for ways to extract that. So yeah, we had to leave that venue. It was under uh, not the best circumstances. Um, but I started looking for other venues, and actually, this is this where we're sitting now is the only venue I even got around to seeing. Oh, really? Yeah, um, it was. It was good. It was just an empty space, but it was basically it was what we needed. Um, so you had to buy the license for it. Uh, the license was uh, twenty three, twenty three grand. And like, so a license to be a comedy place or a license to be a bar. Uh, well, the light, to be honest, the license is a bodega license. It's actually not even ended out to be particularly relevant to what we're doing. Um, but we do have some kind of license, which has value. If we ever get shut down, I, I would be able to sell it, which is nice. Um, so, yeah, I was actually super lucky. About seven years ago, my brother, Joe, the master unicyclist, <laughs> um, he recommended that I put some money into uh, Bitcoin. So I did. And yeah, at that stage, uh, Bitcoin was up. So I was able to sell about, it was about 30,000 euros worth of, of Bitcoin. And I bought the license for this place. And I basically lent Matt uh, half of the money, mm -hmm. uh, which he's paying me back for. And yeah, and then we've been here. So we've been here for 18 months, slowly, slowly building it up. Yeah, well, it's awesome. That's so. It's very. I I feel very fortunate that that you did all of that because Limerick was good, but it was limited because yeah. it was so small. Yeah. Um. So the, you're really restricted into what you can do there. Whereas now, like, is it seventy people or something you can get downstairs? Yeah. Well, I mean, we've done eighty before, but it's really tough. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. About two and a half times the size of, of Limerick, um, yeah. realistically. And there's an actual bar area here. Yeah. Yeah, the bar area is bigger. Um, yeah, it's taken a long time in this new venue to to get up to, to scratch, to get up to a stage where we're kind of making money. And even now, it's like, probably like, July is very, very quiet summer in Barcelona everyone's on the beach mm. um, so we'll maybe even lose money this month you know it's not I wouldn't be that surprising and then there's all these um, fucking expenses that come along like uh, we'll probably have to buy a new air conditioning system so mm. that'll be like 5,000 euros or something like that um, 
But, yeah, it's good having this place because there is more upside for us, effectively. Because it's a bigger space, it means we can have more people sitting around drinking, we can have more people in the shows, we can make money from ticket sales, from stuff during the day as well. It's a good rehearsal space for, for classes and things like that. So, yeah, we can do a lot more here uh, than we were able to do in Limerick. In terms of comedy stuff, yeah, Limerick, we got a lot more people in off of the street. Oh, really? Yeah. It just looks like a nice Irish pub. True. And the, 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 the actual pub area upstairs was quite a lot more welcoming, I think. Um, I don't know why exactly, but, um, yeah. True. I didn't think there'd be that many people that walk around that area, though, because it's kind of like... I suppose it's near the metro, but... um. Yeah, I think probably like a lack of competition. Not a lot of um, pubs in that area. Not True. a lot of... Well, there's, you know, the, the, the normal ones they have on every corner, but... Um, yeah, there wasn't a heck of a lot, heck of, a lot of, of buzz happening. Mm. And so what were the biggest challenges that you faced? Like, how did you go about starting this up? Uh, the biggest challenges... Um, mostly like interpersonal stuff I would say that's that's been the biggest uh, learning thing for me like how to manage people how to show appreciation when people work hard mm. um, how to stick up for myself as well how to um, kind of assert myself in a reasonable way I think some people uh, that I've gotten to know in this time. Uh, well, just in general, I guess, there's some people that will kind of like take advantage of you as much yeah. as you'll let them. Um, so it's about not letting that happen. Uh, but then also, yeah, learning to be patient. Uh, learning to be hardworking. Honestly, I feel like that came along way too late in my life. Um, I feel, yeah. Yeah, like uh, if I was developing some of the skills that I'm developing now in my early 20s, oh my God, I would be so set right now. Um, the importance of doing things right the first time, I never, never appreciated that uh, before starting this place. And even after starting this place, it's only been like recently that I've really seen it. Uh, but there's certain things that we just didn't do right the first time, and now I'm now I'm you know I'm sober. I'm looking at some of this stuff and going, <laughs> "Fuck, this is we got to fix this," you know. And then trying to backtrack or trying to strip everything away, or once you have a, a culture in place, mm. trying to replace that with with more um, strictness or more regulation is really hard. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one example now is, like, how many free drinks we're giving away to, like, comedians and to staff and to, you know, whatever. Um, and we, we have a, effectively a culture. Like, some people will just come and they'll go, like, I'm grabbing my free drinks and they'll, they'll go into the, into the fridge and get it. And it's like, well, we haven't really, like, cracked down on that from an early stage. But now that it's clearly a problem... And because we didn't do it early on, it's going to be such a challenge yeah. to actually implement that. And it's a completely reasonable thing to mm. want to implement. You know, if we just set it on day one, everyone's like, yeah, totally. You're starting a new business. Fair enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? But now that it's happened for so long, it's, um, it's going to be hard to change that. Um... Yeah, those are the big challenges. Just remaining disciplined. Um, having a business partner is like an in, in, intimate relationship that I wasn't uh, prepared for. Um, yeah, it is basically like having a having like a girlfriend or boyfriend. Yeah. Just with no sex, hopefully. No sex. That's the big problem. <laughs> That would make it smoother. So yeah, but it's kind of you know it's it's at the end of the day it's, there's like a lot of problems, but it's it's a sense of purpose as well, right? Like mm. that's huge. And most people don't have that. There's no yeah, yeah. most people don't have meaning in their lives. So it's like yeah, I I get to come in here and see that the fucking air conditioning's broken and it's like leaking all over the floor and shit like that. It's like 
I'll mope about it, but at the same time, it's like, all right, well, now there's another thing for me to fix, you know? Yeah, now yeah. I have a have a, a, a challenge to bust, you know? Yeah. Um, so I try and try and look at look at it like that. Especially, there's just a big dearth of of, of, of meaning in the world. Uh, I think in general. Why uh, do you think that is? Uh, I think we've just become really disconnected from one another um, with COVID and with uh, social media and with um, political divides and with this like kind of boxing we do i think people are kind of scared to have an opinion that lies outside of the norm mm. um are wanting to kind of maintain their position within whatever small social circle they have whether it's on the internet or whatever so they're maybe looking to jump down other people's throats uh and then with covid I feel like I forgot how to just sort of be with other people. I mean, I was never very good at it in the first place, but um, feels like it's been exacerbated. Uh, yeah, those are probably the main things. So then, I mean, the, being able to, the way I see it is, is sort of battle against that, you know, to like create a create a community which a lot of people don't have uh, and allow people to meet each other and sort of hone these skills and also like to create some of the videos we get to create and there's, yeah. a, there's, there's so many fun things that we, we get to do um, and they're all uh, they all align with uh, like a greater purpose yeah, I think it's like that that sense of purpose. I saw, can't remember who it was that said it again, um, but the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is purpose. Because um, it's like you're trying to fill that void with whatever until that void is filled by meaning and purpose. And it's like, obviously working for yourself or running a business is is stressful, but it's a totally different type of stress because it's your stress and it's like stuff that you have to do which ultimately is benefiting just you and the people that you've chosen to be involved yeah so it's like the, the sense of purpose is just massive like i run a I, in the same situation where i'm running a couple of businesses with my business partner also but it's just like you said that the running of the business is actually the easy part it's all the other stuff on the outside like maintaining that relationship learning how to like talk about money and those things without mm -hmm. getting annoyed and irritated totally. um learning how to manage people i think i'm pretty terrible at it mm -hmm. um but like learning those skills um and again learning that that my partner is very disciplined um it, he's, just, he's a workaholic basically and so like i'm learning some of taking some of his workaholicness and i think he's learning a little bit of my relaxation <laughs> which sometimes stems towards too much relaxation but yeah it needs to be that little balance and i think it's a good it, it works well but obviously then you're doing everything together so you end up getting irritated at each other um but then it's like learning to just learning to just communicate well like communication is is like the number one thing that makes life really easy like yeah. if you're excellent at communication life is pretty easy um, because you can just navigate your way through all situations mm -hmm. well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, one concept I've been I've been working on recently is the the idea of like not not allowing anything to take up space in my mind if it's a waste of time basically yeah. so I'll, I'll i'm get i get super anxious right so often i'll i'll i don't know have an argument with someone or i'll be meaning to have an argument with someone or i'll like there'll be something going on and it's really like it's so bad that it's like oh that's like a week of my life you, you know if i don't do anything about it it's like that's a week of time where that's the only thing i can think about and i'm not like sitting and writing anything that's interesting i'm not really like doing any i can probably get through the work that i have to do but i'm not like coming up with new ideas for exciting stuff to do so then it's like well once recognizing when i'm in that situation 
and then going okay how like what's the quickest way to to resolving this mm. which is usually like sitting down with the person and being like look this is this is how this looks from my perspective there's no way that it looks like that from your perspective because you wouldn't look at yourself like that or you know vice versa or whatever uh and sort of figuring out what it is you know um yeah i found that with i found that like i learned that the hard way just in relationships like my girlfriend now when we when we started like we'd be battling it out because neither of us would ever back down from anything so we'd be battling it out for ages and ages and then you spend days just pissed off and then now it's like it, it seems to often happen like when we're apart like i go away to england or to ireland for a while every so often and like then we there'll be some stupid argument that's just comes up from texting basically you know when things are just mis misinterpreted mm -hmm. um and it'd be like before it'd be like days of being pissed off and now each time it happens it's like that time is getting shorter the time where i'm like look just stop doing this just like apologize or just say the, yeah, the yeah. like the reason it's like that's getting shorter and i'm like man if this conflict resolution can just be taken down to like a minute or something like and then you move on in <laughs> the time which you're not fighting is like 99.9% .9 of the time yeah. and that's amazing yeah yeah totally and it's definitely reduced but I'm like I just like you said I wish I'd learned how to communicate properly like 10 years ago yeah yeah it would have saved so much heartbreak for sure I mean a lot of this stuff is like stuff I'm is very recent that I'm learning and it's it's before I had a girlfriend uh, like last year and I think there was a lot of stuff that was like kind of annoying to me, but not annoying enough to to bother having the conversation yeah, yeah. about. So I'd just be like, no, no, okay, whatever. Like, it's fine. And then I'd shift slightly, right? Just a little bit. But then you do that every day or you do that, you know, every week or whatever, just little shifts, just little shifts. And then, you know, by the end of 18 months or whatever, you look back and go, wow, this is, I'm completely different now. <laughs> of like all of the things that I valued, all of these important things, I've like shifted on them because I was unwilling to have uh, the conversation or it was like too small of a deal for me to, to bother kind of putting up a boundary in that situation. Yeah. So it's both. Maybe now I'm a bit too vigilant. Maybe now as soon as something <laughs> happens, I'm like, let's talk about this shit. And I was <laughs> like, dude, fucking chill, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely went too far the other way. Yeah. I think now I'm in like a happy medium of like, let something slide and try and kind of like, because there's also the, the, what used to happen would be like, those little tiny things just keep happening and you don't say anything in a nice way and then you'll have an argument or you'll get drunk or something and just blur all of them out at the totally the wrong time and mm -hmm. they lose all of their meaning and it's just totally. like so annoying. Well, it's also when you're just trying to, when you like I get this sometimes when I'm trying to have a real conversation about like a deep concern with something about the way I work with someone or whatever it is. And then they'll pull out like five or six things. And it's like, no, no, but that's reactionary. Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. not, I'm, I'm like this issue I've thought about deeply and I'm bringing up because it's serious and you're just like reaching for a quiver yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. to like shoot things. It's like I, I, these days, because I'm, I'm kind of uh, mentally ready for it. If there's any problems with with the way that I am, I do genuinely want to hear about it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I'm like, lay it on me, and I'll like, I'll like, I might disagree. I might be like, yeah, I know that I came across like that, but I was doing it for a different reason, or I'm gonna keep being like that anyway. But I do want to hear about it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want it to like be bottled up for 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 a while and then hear about it all at once, because then it doesn't seem very genuine, right? It seems like that stuff's being uh, pulled out to, to hurt uh, rather than to, to look for solutions or to be constructive or whatever. Yeah, like sometimes like I had a, with my family, we had, it, it, I can't remember how it came up, but it basically ended up just being on, on Christmas day and, and like the evening, everyone had had a few drinks except me. Um, and it basically just ended up being a, a session where my family just told me all the things they don't like about me oh, yeah. um, and the way that I communicate and stuff. So I just sat there for like about an hour while they just unloaded wow. and just told me everything. And like a lot of it was, I felt was just total projection. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't like this about you because I do the exact same thing and I don't like it about myself. And I'm like, but I just had to sit there and not say anything. 
And then afterwards, then they like all individually apologized to me at like the end of the day or the next day. Like, I think we might have been a bit harsh on you and like just ganged up. I'm like, yeah, maybe. Like, yeah. But, but I do want to hear it. But like, there's some things that they were telling me. And I'm like, why have you not told me this? Yeah. Like, if, totally. If, like, if you don't like the way that I'm doing this, why have you not told me? Yeah, if someone's your family or your friend and they ever say to you, look, you've you've stunk for the past two years, it's like, dude, that's not yeah. that's not a friend move, you know? <laughs> Why have you not told me? And then, like, I was getting totally conflicting information as well. Like, one of my sisters told me I only talk about myself, and then my other sister told me she only wants to hear me talk about myself. She doesn't want to hear me debating about other things. Yeah. So I'm like... <laughs> which one is it and then my mum says no I don't agree I don't think he just talks about himself either so I'm like I've got I've got someone in the middle and someone on either side yeah, I'm yeah. like what am I supposed to do here I'll just not talk well I mean in that situation you have to really fucking navigate through this shit as well man because like yeah you have to you have to decide whether this is something I'm sure they probably mean it right but Sometimes people are just in this, like, um, fight-or-flight type mode where they're just trying to, like, hurl shit at you and it's coming out of nowhere. It's not really based in how you are. It's way more based in how how they are, right? Yeah, yeah. And I would imagine, I don't know how, how uh, you feel about this, but if, you're, if you've stopped drinking and they are all still drinking, I would imagine there's, like, a, a feeling of being judged um, <laughs> to some extent. I don't know. Um, or, yeah, I think so. I certainly, I get that impression from people sometimes. Yeah, it's very difficult not to come across as judgmental and condescending. It doesn't help either that I've got like a neutral monotone voice. So mm. it's like people just think I'm just like being patronizing and I'm like, no, no, this is my genuine, emo genuine emotional voice. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, well done. And they're like all right, I need to be sarcastic. I'm like, no, no, that, that's, that's my level of expression here. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's really difficult. So where do you do your, your learning of these things? Like what, through what modes? Oh, like um, podcasts. It's, uh, yeah, that's how I absorb most of the information I have is through like YouTube. Um, actually, there's a guy, Modern, the Modern Wisdom podcast. Yeah, I've listened um, to a bit of that. He's really great, this guy, Chris Williamson. I thought maybe you're... This is the quest for wisdom, right? So I thought maybe it was sort of based on that. Um, but no, he's... when I found out that he had one called Modern Wisdom, I was pissed off. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wrote him a season I think, I, think I, I think I outdate him, though. Cause really? I, I think so. I mean, the quest for wisdom would like started off as a blog, and I started writing that in 2019. I don't know when he started Modern Wisdom, but I feel like it's only... Yeah, it's only come up on my algorithms in the past like year or two. It's yeah, it's exploded recently, um, but I feel like it might have been longer than that. Oh, um, bastard! He seems to be absolutely killing it though. He's yeah, on, yeah. he's on my algorithm all the time. Yeah, he does. He has really in interesting conversations with lots and lots of different people. Um, he uh, has interesting like personal life experiences as well. He, you know, he stopped drinking for a thousand days uh, and sort of talks about how that was for him. And uh, yeah, just has a really good insight on a lot of stuff. I mean, there's there's probably uh, three or four people that I that I listen to that I get what I feel like is is good advice from. Who are they? Um, Charlie Hoopert. Oh, I don't know him. Um, he's a little more a little more niche. He actually, he started a, a, a YouTube channel called Charisma on Command years and years ago. Uh, he's not really got anything to do with it anymore, but he, he sort of made it to, to YouTube fame um, that way. Uh, and he does, a, he does a podcast where he takes questions from the, the patrons. I'm one of the patrons for him. It's the only person I'm a patron for. And yeah, he'll just answer people's questions. And him having run a business and started a YouTube channel, and he has quite a good perspective on different things. So, so is he business um, oriented? He's a creative person, primarily a creative person that has had success in in business, uh, but is a lot more uh, feelings led. Okay, I would say uh, a lot more kind of emotional. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I've written in and asked questions to him, and and I I, I identify with a lot of the questions. Like what sort of questions? Um. Well, the one I wrote him was about we were maybe thinking about having an investor come in on the comedy clubhouse. So it was about how I could be most um, convincing to the to the investor. Um, but he gave me <laughs> he gave me the the wrong answer, the, not what I wanted to hear. What, what did he say? Uh, he he basically said, "Look, it sounds like from your from your the tone of what you're writing, it sounds like um, you're looking for somebody else to do this." for you and that's not going to happen um you have to kind of do it yourself and don't expect to be saved by anyone else if you have a common vi vision and it works out then then great but don't be trying to convince someone of something you should just be trying to sort of show them yeah what it is you're already doing um but how is that the wrong answer it's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, so you wanted to be like, step one, step two. I was like, you're the charisma guy, man. Like, you're, that's, that's fucking your job, is you're like, how do I convince someone of this, you know? So, yeah, I wanted, I wanted like, some, I guess, like, posture tips and, like, <laughs> this is how you trick someone. Um, but, no, I mean, since then, I, I don't know if it was particularly related to his advice, probably a little bit, and then I, I think I got sober since then as well, but I've certainly, I've taken more... Um, responsibility over all different aspects of this place. Are you still looking for an investor? No. No. No, not really. Yeah, because I don't know, like we, I had the same thing with my business partner like where we had people offering us money, but we were like, really, we're doing okay. We're growing organically mm -hmm. at a decent rate. Someone comes in then and invests in it. It just throws a massive spanner in the works. It's like, it's only if you want to go from like this level to a 500 person capacity venue or something. It's like, it's not grassroots, then it just changes it. Yeah, it would change it entirely. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, there was, there was other reasons to, to, to bring this person on board other than just, just money. Um, but I, I have always liked the idea of just creating it as we want to create it and... Um, you know, growing over time and yeah, just kind of being a bit more like Barcelona led and focused and yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm, and I'm also doing all of the things now that uh, any investor would have done. I kind of just started being better at most of the stuff. So, And do you, do you have any major, fr do you ever have any major frictions with like, the path to go down with Matt as in like major disagreements on where to go what are your plans uh yeah I mean the major major disagreement between me and Matt is uh I would say I would say that he's more willing to trust that things will be fine in their time and I'm more inclined to uh plan for the future and mm. i'd be much more anxious about like the possibility of this getting closed down for example uh you know the police have come that's a very real risk uh or you know the possibility that we might not be able to sell booze anymore or um you know that kind of thing so my focus much more than his is uh making money mm -hmm. um it's not my entire focus but it's a big part of it i'm like yeah. the more like if we can get up to selling 15 euro tickets and we're selling out shows it's fine that any problem can come along and it'll be all right you know yeah yeah um like now of the last few months i've managed to to cleave out a little bit of money and it's like great well the air conditioning is going to keep being a problem so let's just buy a new air conditioning mm. system it's going to be like five grand or whatever but because I've focused on that recently and I've taken care, we're in a position to, to do that. Yeah. Um, so that is, I think, a, a, a big difference. He wants, he likes the idea of things being free um, or not, not even necessarily free, but like cheap and of like letting people in for free and that kind of thing. And my position is like, 
yes, it's our community, but also they're our customers. Yeah, if, yeah. If we're, if we're giving them drinks for free and giving them tickets for free, they're not customers at that stage. Um, and I'm just more interested, I would say, in like the business aspects of things. Like yeah. I'm, I'm like, I like the idea of, of looking at the bar and going, okay, how can we optimize this? How yeah. can we make the drinks the perfect price that, that people will still want to buy them and we will make the best margins on them? You know, like that's for me is an interesting idea. Uh, whereas for him, I don't think it's particularly interesting. Um, I find it. I find it very within the creative scene. No matter where you go, there's always this big, like, sort of divide of things need to be free because it's art. But it's also like that's why all artists are poor. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like people are, people want to live their life as artists, doing you know. When I say artist, I mean obviously any form of the arts. Mm -hmm. But it's like you have to make a living and things are expensive and it like people have to, you have to pay wages. You have to do this, that and the other. Totally. And it's like, of course there should be some free events occasionally, you know, so that people can come along um, or not even necessarily free, but like lower cost. And you do get those with open mics, you know, that are, are lower cost. Mm -hmm. But ultimately if you want to see the, the headlining people, that costs money and people have to make that decision, whether that's worth it <laughs> for them. Totally. And it's, there's, I mean, from a business perspective, uh, there's, I, I was just doing a, I do some business courses online as well. So there's one from a guy called Alex Hormozzi, but he talks about like pricing stuff and how, how bad people are at recognizing what something is actually worth. Yeah. Like people only know how much something is worth is be because you set that as the price, right? Yeah. So you set the price of a flamenco show at, at 15 euros. That's what people think it's worth. So we value comedy shows at three euros, five euros. People think that that's what it's worth. Mm. If we get to a stage where we're able to value it at 15 euros, that's what people think it is worth. And then they go in, they pay 15 euros, they have a 15 euro experience, uh, which means like psychologically they go into it with more commitment. Yeah. Uh, they basically, they enjoy it more. They think the quality of the production is better. Um, yeah, they they like did a test on on different wines. It was all the same hmm. same red wine, right? But they stuck different labels on them, and they said, you know, this one cost five euros, and this one cost twenty euros, and this one cost one hundred and fifty euros, and and they did these like uh, taste tests of all of these wines, got people to decide which one tasted better, and invariably, always the most expensive one tasted better in that order, right? Yeah. Um, and it was the same wine. It's the same fucking wine. It's just that people thought that if you paid more for it, it was better. Um, so, yeah, I think I think doing stuff for free is silly if you can sell it. It's also that, you know, with there's, there's secret comedy clubs doing stuff now, if we were to get into a position with them where the competition is about who has the cheapest show, then it's just a really bad spot to be in right yeah, because race to the bottom race to the bottom um and then you can't pay anyone and then the the game that we're playing is who can work with the least amount of staff to yeah. be able to carve out the the best margins so that they can survive longer than everyone else and it's like nah dude that fucking sucks <laughs> um so Whereas the other way, right? So, so you try and reduce the price. The lowest you can go is, is zero euros. Try and increase the price. Well, the highest you can go is infinity. I mean, not, not really. But like, yeah, you you could absolutely court, you know, uh, super wealthy crypto millionaires and get them to come for some kind of an exclusive comedy experience where it costs 150 euros each, yeah. and they get caviar with their drink or some shit like that you know there's no there's creative ways to like raise the price yeah but you can only lower the price uh so much before you die um so yeah, yeah. philosophically that's that's how i feel about it and i just don't think that it's bad to make money or that I, th I like i really think the more money we we make the happier everyone is there's, yeah, there's the like cool basically there's do. no downside to it um because ultimately it's like 
this is what when when people moan about ticket prices for things like some places do just rip you off but ultimately the price between paying like let's say three euros and the price between paying six euros for entering somewhere doesn't really it's not it's not going to break your bank yeah it's like ultimately it's like you're going to a show you know the difference between three and 30 is obviously a lot yeah but for most people who are earning like an expat wage um, or even like you know a, a standard wage in most of the companies where people work you can afford to pay a tenner to go into a show you just can um, yeah. and it's like all the comedians then in the background are like slaving their guts off to then be able to put on this stuff for zero yeah for the privilege for the privilege of just practicing and then other people are basically getting that experience for free whereas it's like it would be really like I, I've I've been wanting to run like, a, a music night for a while, like mm -hmm. acoustic music. Um, and I've just been thinking about it and going to go see a venue and stuff. But it's like, I want to be able to pay the people that perform, even a token amount. You know, like there's a few events that I've performed at in Barcelona. Comedy and More is one of them with Harris, where you get a tenner. Or yeah. like La, La, La Rubia mm -hmm. with Enter the Coronaverse. They give you a tenner. And that tenner was so it's like one of the probably the sweetest tenor i've ever earned yeah yeah because like all those months of like writing stuff and going on stage and hating life because you're so awkward on stage and then you get a tenor totally like, yeah, yeah entry in a tenor and i'm like it's an awesome thing to be able to pay people to be able to give people a wage and to be able to just give a token amount to the people who turn up yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it's an awesome thing it's really validating for people um yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what happens with it, but I think that's ultimately going to be the uh, the battle. I'm going to want to raise prices as much as I can, as quick as I can, and um, Matt's going to push back on that overall. Um, Hopefully, then you can find a, a happy medium. Well, I, don't f I guess if I thought that he was thinking about it in the same way that I am, then well, it's just. I don't know. I don't know to what extent he's he's like analyzing it, you know. Um, like I want to raise prices on the drinks, but the reason I want to do that is because I did like a spreadsheet of all of the exact prices of all of the drinks, and I've looked at like how much we're multiplying, and I've like watched videos on how bars make money and all of this. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, hey, with all of this, I'd like to raise money on raise the prices of drinks. Uh, whereas his feeling is a bit more like. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, let's keep things cheap. Why can't everything be cheap? And it's like, ah, I don't know, whatever. Um, probably a good, he's a, he's a good um, anchor. He's a good, uh, he's a good instinct. Uh, because sometimes I, I want things to change much more quickly mm -hmm. than, than things are capable of changing. Um, and... Sometimes when I when I get in that sort of rush mode, um, I can make terrible decisions. So, yeah, so. I know that well. Sometimes I'm like, I, I, I have a tendency to totally underestimate how long things take. So sometimes I'll tell a customer like, yeah, yeah, I'll have that done by the end of the day. And then my, my partner comes to me, he's like, Connor, like, you're never going to have that done before the end of the day. And I'm like, yeah, maybe it won't be the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's but good. in my head, I'm like, oh, well, the, the, the steps are pretty simple. Like, you just do this, put it up there, like, blah, 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 type this. But it's like the reality of it, it takes way longer. And things yeah, need yeah. to, like, slowly grow. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's quite, it, it's quite nice take, like, just letting things go at, at, at the right pace and watching it organically as opposed to just sometimes just trying to be like boom 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 and like stack loads of shit together yeah that's my that is my instinct to do that but but i just i really don't think i mean we could have let this place organically grow and maybe maybe the enthusiasm would have spread and maybe people would have talked about it or whatever it's just not a you can't guarantee it you can't guarantee anything like that you know whereas you get up every day, you look at the numbers, you look at this, you learn something about how to how to run a business, you see what's worked for other businesses mm. in the past, and then you like enact that shit. You still can't guarantee it, but you can get really, really close, I would say. Yeah, you can give yourself the best chance of it. Uh -huh. um, okay, it's coming to 2.30 now, and I know you have got to go. So before we end, um, I need from you words of wisdom for the quest for wisdom. Words of wisdom. Uh, words of wisdom. I don't know if I have any of that. Uh, 
it's so don't like don't push too much push just the right amount right think about it if you're like um flirting with a girl or like dating someone or something like that and you have that like tension and 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 it's kind of like a dance that you can play where you push a little bit and then you see what the response is like and then maybe it's bad so you like fall back a little bit or something like that um so push but just push and listen push a little and listen i don't know if that makes sense makes sense so yeah push and wait for the response yeah from the universe from the universe from the yeah just trust the universe something like that or or the response from the person you're trying to court yeah i don't know why i keep going to like dating examples for stuff but uh, it's a pretty good it's a pretty good um <laughs> way to think about the world i think yeah well thank you john it has been a pleasure i have one last little gift for you which is a quest for wisdom t-shirt yeah! Nice. Actually, um, I saw Harris got one of these after his podcast, and it wasn't. It was a little bit in the back of my mind that, that maybe there would be a, a, a t-shirt at the end of this. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been lovely to have you. We'll have you again in the future. This has been a little quick one um, because now we have the comedy fringe in Barcelona. Yep. Um, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Instagram, John Alice uh, with A W L I S comedy john ellis comedy uh and i'm at the comedy clubhouse so come visit come see a show you'll probably see me around as well okay well thank you very much john farewell for now goodbye Bye. thank you for listening to the quest for wisdom podcast with your host connor monaghan if you enjoyed the episode and would like to support the show then please like it subscribe and leave a review on whichever platform you are using this small act is a massive help and is hugely appreciated you can find more information about all of our guests on thequestforwisdom.com and follow us at The Quest for Wisdom on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter for exciting updates. We also have a Patreon account for anyone who would like to contribute towards the running of the show. Finally, I would like to thank the Comedy Clubhouse in Barcelona for allowing us to record here and for their ongoing support. If you are ever in Barcelona, make sure to check it out for daily shows of comedy and performance art in English. Farewell for now.